Now let me make two comments. Firstly, you'll see I have many more axes than graphs, and the reason why is because I'm going to compare in a second each of these graphs against its derivative. So you'll see me do that in a second. Secondly, critical value is just a heading. This is not a great title for um, what we're looking at today. Um, it's not like, say, the phrase stationary points. When you say stationary points, everyone knows what you're talking about. There's no ambiguity. It's a completely agreed upon term. Not so much when we talk about critical values. If you say critical values to one mathematician versus another, they'll be like, well, wh what kind of critical values do you mean? Um, as you'll see, essentially, I'm using them to indicate something interesting happens that doesn't fall into the categories of the other um, language that I've already told you about, okay? As you'll see in the pictures, okay? There are some more, there's a, there's a finer definition, but like I said, not everyone agrees on it, okay? So it's kind of just like a, an okay name, but don't expect that, oh, everyone knows what these are. Different textbooks will use it differently as well, okay? Let's start by having a look at the first one. It's probably the most familiar out of these, and also the simplest, right? In some ways, you can actually just graph this without anything about the derivative, but the derivative is actually what we're interested in, okay? So, how would you describe the graph of y equals absolute value of x? A piecemeal. It's, um, number one, it's piecemeal, okay? And the two kinds of parts of the piecemeal function are, it comes down to the origin, and then it bounces back off. In fact, that's kind of what absolute value sign uh, graphs are often given as a sort of you know flat definition. They're the ones that bounce off the axis, okay? No big deal. Now, we usually would say this is the absolute value of x, but since it was pointed out, this is a piecemeal function, and actually having the different equations of the branches of the graph is really useful to us. What's the uh, equation on the right-hand side? It's just x, and over here, good. So. I'm going to use this, and I'd love you to, if your graphs just go down the page, maybe you want to draw these extra graphs, these extra axes, um, just to the right of them, okay, but my minor underneath. I'm going to graph this time, over here, x against its derivative, dy on dx, okay? <coughs> so I can define this axis to be whatever I want, so I'm going to define it to be the derivative of this guy, okay? Now, when you look at this, y equals x, we don't need to do any computation here. The derivative of y equals x just by definition is one. one, right? Now I can draw that. I can pop it over here. Okay, so here's my derivative, dy on dx equals one. Okay, that's all fine. That's the right-hand branch. On the left-hand side, derivative of this guy is Minus negative one. one. Okay. So what have I got over here? So, yep. I'm not finished, so yeah, I maybe after I, I'm done you can ask. Now, you will notice I, I now have some problems here, right? The graph of absolute value of x is a continuous graph. Do you remember when we used to talk about continuity, right? So this continuous, I can, I can draw this thing without lifting up my whiteboard marker, without my, and my pencil, right? It's defined at the origin, right? It passes through there, all good, okay? I mean, if I wanted to make it super obvious, I'd put a filled circle there, but I don't need to, right? I, I don't need to say anything unusual is happening there. It's just continuous, okay? But when you get to here, you have this discontinuity pretty obviously, right? It is defined all the way over here, and defined all the way over here, but in order to have continuity, in order to have a value right there in the middle, okay? Do you remember we talked about this? Um, I can talk about the limit of the absolute value of x as x approaches 0 <coughs> from below, or from the left in this context. And I can say, well, that's equal to the limit of the absolute value of x when I think about it from the other direction. Do you remember this? It's been a while since we introduced this language of notation. So this means, as you're getting closer and closer to 0, if you come from this side, or you come from this side, you're getting the same value. You're both going towards zero. All good. Okay? But it breaks down here, right? Do you see that? The limit as I'm approaching from the left, and the limit as I'm approaching from the right, have nothing to do with each other. Okay? So there is a discontinuity, not in the graph, but in its derivative. Does that make sense? Let's draw that in, shall we? It is not defined for x equals zero. So I'm just going to put a dotted line there because they are vertically above each other. Okay, so my derivative has a discontinuity here. So far, so good, right? 
Let's now come over here and talk about the cube root of x. Okay? Now, you have some, um, if you think back to the end of last year, back when you were fresh faced year 10 students, you would have learned that this guy here, the cube root of x, is an inverse function. What's it an inverse function of? Yeah. Cubic function. It's an inverse of the cubic function, right? So we know what this looks like. We have a pretty good idea of what this looks like, okay? Well, the relationship between this guy and this guy is that because you swap the x's and y's around, right, you are rotate, sorry, you're reflecting this graph to get this graph. How am I reflecting it? Which way am I reflecting it? I'm going to flip it across. Now, let me give you the classic example of an inverse, right? The classic example is the exponential function versus the log, log function, right? So you have those there. Now, it's really easy to see off of that example. You just have to turn your head 45 degrees, right? And then you put in your x equals y graph, and you can see the symmetry, okay? I'm getting the same kind of thing for this graph, right? This is the shape I'm going to get. Okay? So here's my cube root of x, right? You notice if you turn your head, it does behave a lot like um, y equals x cubed, but everything is, you know, reversed around. And if you um, imagine my y equals x through here, I'm not going to put it in because it's going to cloud my diagram. When I put it in, you can do the reflection and you'll get that. What's that called? What does the cube root cube, y equals x cube, what does it do at the origin? It has a horizontal point of inflection. Very good, okay? Now here, everything's being reflected across. Everything's off by 90 degrees. So instead of a horizontal point, I have a vertical point, right? So this is the cube root of x, okay? Now something a little more interesting happens when I go to the derivative. I'm just gonna use this space over here. How am I going to do something, how am I gonna rewrite this in order to make it differentiatable? Yeah, into it. Okay, I'm gonna put it in index form. I'm very good at differentiating things in index form, right? So I'm gonna say this is number two. Y equals x to the power of a third, yeah? So dy on dx, what do we do with this thing? U <laughs> okay. U minus one. Good. A third comes out the front, oh, front. and then the power reduces oh, by one. Mark that. It's a bit weird. But a third, take away one, is negative two thirds. Okay. Now, a third x to the negative two thirds. That's a weird function. Uh, I don't really know off the top of my head what it looks like, but I can work out some interesting things about it fairly easily. For instance, has a negative index. What does that mean usually? It means that you're actually not multiplying again and again and again. That's powers, what we usually think of. But you are dividing, right? So this x to the 2 thirds really belongs on the denominator. You see that? Okay. Now that you've written it in this form, just like over here with our absolute value of x, you see this guy has a problem, right? He doesn't exist for all real x. No discontinuities, no discontinuities. But, where does it break down? Zero. X equals zero, okay? Now, we have this picture, so we kind of have a reason to understand why it breaks down <coughs> X equals zero, right? What's the gradient at the origin? That's a bit tricky because gradient is rise over run, isn't it? Rise over run. But it's not running anywhere. It's just a vertical it's line zero. at that point. Just like the cubic is a horizontal line, this is vertical. So it's rise over no run happening and we know that division by zero causes us these problems. Okay. So, what's this thing going to look like? 1 over 3x to the 2 thirds. Hmm. It's always increasing. Ah, okay. So this guy, hold on, be careful, right? As you put in some numbers, we can actually try some numbers because we have no idea what this looks like, right? As x gets bigger, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens to x to the 2 thirds? Hmm. As x gets bigger, what happens to x to the two thirds? It's now hold on a second. Hold on a second. Think about some numbers, right? Like say a thousand to the power of two thirds. Okay? That means you take the cube root, that's the third part, and then you square it. This is a hundred. Okay, you're right with that? Um, what about say a million to the power of two thirds? What's that? Ten. 
You do the you do the cube root, right? Which gives you only two of the zeros, and then you square it, so ten thousand. I think. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now it's growing. It's not growing super fast, but it's still growing. Okay. So if your denominator is growing, what's happening to the whole thing? It's getting smaller. The whole thing is getting smaller. It's approaching. The limit of this as x approaches infinity is zero. Okay. So I'm doing something like this, right? Okay. Now, again, still thinking about this derivative, right? You see how there's a two there? See how there's a two? I can rewrite that with the two sort of further out. It's actually a function that's been squared. What do we know about functions that are squared in terms it's of their shape? Uh, it's always positive, it's so it's even. always going to be above. And more importantly, it's even, right? So if this is happening here on the right-hand side, then over here on the left-hand side, I'm doing the same thing. I have that even symmetry, OK? What's happening in the middle? OK, so x can't equal 0. Right? X can't equal zero. Like that. Okay. With a vertical asymptote, we know it's not just that like I'm gonna approach it. You can never ever touch it, as opposed to horizontal asymptotes, which you can cross all the time. Okay? So really, it looks like I'm getting something like that. That's a bit weird, okay? It's rough, but you get the idea. Does it gel with the picture that we have? Think about it. Uh, increasing function looks like to me, increasing at different rates. But does this reflect an increasing function? Answer? Yeah. It does, because this is the derivative, dy on dx, and it's always positive. The sign is what I'm interested in, right? If you wanted to do it like this, you would say green for gradient. Right? All these green pluses here means this thing is all above the axis. That looks good. What about this stuff happening in here? Does it make sense? Over here, I'm shallow, close to zero. As I approach x equals 0, it's getting steep. It's getting really steep. Yeah, it goes so steep, it goes to vertical. Okay? So that's why this value is so high. And then it does the same thing in reverse. Okay? Are you happy with that? Does that make sense? By the way, uh, yeah, I'll point it out now. We were talking about even symmetry to graph that thing. Are there any other even functions on the board? The very first one we drew is an even function. Does this have any kind of symmetry? Mm. Oh. <coughs> yeah. It's odd, right? It's odd. What about this? That's odd. Even. And that's even. Oh, hmm. damn, I forgot. 